Welcome, everyone. Uh, so happy to have you all here today. Konstantinos Daskalakis is a professor of EECS at MIT, and Fotini Christia is a professor of political science also at MIT. So it seemed fitting on the occasion of the bicentennial of the Greek Revolution in 1821 to have these two academic luminaries discuss the new revolution of tomorrow, taking place with technologies such as artificial intelligence, machine learning, and data science, as well as the implications on education, ethics, and society at large. The event today was brought to you by the Hellenic Innovation Network and outgrowth of MIT Enterprise Forum Greece, which was created with the support of the Consulate General of Greece in Boston with the goal of accelerating technological innovation and entrepreneurship in Greece by leveraging the Greek diaspora. We disseminate Greek startup news to our network. We broadcast educational webcasts like the one today. We host monthly meetings of our CEO group, and we also host pitching and networking events, which are open to everyone in the community. We hope you will register at hellenic.org to be part of our community, and also check us out on Spotify. I'd like to welcome now Vasilis Papakonstantinou, the Vice Chair of MIT Enterprise Forum Greece. Vasilis. Thank you, Marina. Hello, everyone. Nine years ago, uh, in February 2012, with a group of friends, we pondered the idea of bringing the global network of MIT Enterprise Forum to Greece to help the fledgling startup community grow faster. We watched the effort put by many others in the community, and we thought that the MIT brand name, the experience, and the network could accelerate the process. It took us nine months and a fancy dinner at the Acropolis Museum to turn around the original reply don't call us, we will call you, that we got from the MITF executive team. It was then when the journey started and brought us to this point today. Our initial goal was to use the MIT Enterprise Forum Global Network to source experience and other resources for the Greek entrepreneurs. But quickly, we realized that we had to engage the Greek diaspora if we wanted to succeed. It took us some more time to convince Marina to join the network, and then on April 1st uh, of 2015, we organized a meeting at the offices of the MIT Technology Review. In the room, there were many of the successful Greek techies from around the Boston metro area. Some of them had never connected before, but all of them agreed to join forces under the temporary name of MITF Greece Greek Tech Diaspora. The group grew larger quickly with more busy people lending their precious time, experience, and resources. Eventually, in late 2018, as a tribute to Marina's father who had passed away a few months before and with the support of the Greek Consul General in Boston, our good friend Stratos uh, Eftimiu, we created the Hellenic Innovation Network. Last week, another group of people with more resources led by Marcos Veremis decided to take this effort to a next level with the Innovative Greeks Initiative. As Marcos said during his remarks, quoting a famous Greek singer, it takes small groups of friends to make things happen while they are having fun. It was then when I realized that happiness is to feel that these things grow much larger, much larger than the original group of friends that started them. In a funny way, the pandemic drove us apart and led to the creation of this webcast. But at the same time, it drew us closer, bringing all of these people together. It takes this opportunity to build more robust networks of people that can change, that can change things for the better. Now I would like to welcome our good friend Stratos Eftimiu, the Council General of Greece, to introduce our guest speakers. Trato. Thank you, Vasily. Uh, it has been an incredible uh, journey and a very nice story of innovation. And it, will, it, it has been for me a great pleasure working with you, the members of the MIT Enterprise Forum Greece, and of course, uh, with Marina and the uh, Hellenic Innovation uh, Network. Uh, usually we, uh, uh, featuring our events, uh, entrepreneurs, venture capitalists, innovation experts. Uh, but today we commemorate the bicentennial of uh, the Greek Revolution and we decided to break our rules and broaden the theme of our discussion. We will discuss uh, artificial intelligence, which is so much connected to the innovation and, to, and is revolutionizing uh, the modern economy. But we will also do it from a political and social science uh, prism. We thought that this is a timely discussion with uh, unique educational value. 
And if there was one force that changed the fate of the Greek nation and uh, led to its awakening, that was the Greek enlightenment and its emphasis on the value of education. So we are uh, truly honored to have with us two exceptional Greek academics who thrive at MIT and are at the forefront of their scientific uh, fields. We would need one uh, whole webinar to introduce Professor Daskalakis and Professor Christia properly. But uh, uh, let me at least say that uh, Fotini Christia uh, is a professor of political science at MIT. She has a PhD from Harvard and an MA and BA from Columbia. Her research interests deal with issues of conflict and she has written a multiple award winning book on alliance formation in civil wars. Uh, I would like to congratulate her because last fall she became the director of the MIT Sociotechnical Systems uh, Research Center, a lab which seeks solutions to complex societal uh, changes. Professor uh, Daskalakis is a, a professor of electrical engineering and computer science at MIT, a member of MIT's computer science and artificial intelligence laboratory with a PhD for, from Berkeley and a diploma from the Technical uh, University of Athens the National Technical University of Athens. He works on computation theory and its interface with uh, game theory, probability theory, statistics, and machine learning, namely all the fields upon which artificial intelligence is uh, being uh, built. Uh, Professor Daskalakis has resolved long-standing long problems about the computational complexity of Nash equilibrium, and he has been honored with the prestigious Rolf Nevalina Prize. Uh, Kostis will share with us his uh, thought on uh, his thoughts on artificial intelligence and his uh, praiseworthy vision to create an institute in Athens of uh, 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 dealing with uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, and uh, uh, later on, uh, Fotini will uh, uh, will join the discussion to um, discuss the social and th ethical implications and the moral conundrums of AI uh, technologies. And uh, Michael Bletchers, the research uh, science, scientist and the director of computing of the MIT, uh, will uh, join the discussion uh, to uh, catalyze the Q&A session. Uh, Koste, uh, the floor is yours. is yours. Thank you for doing this. Uh, hi, everybody. I would like to thank the Hellenic Innovation uh, Network for uh, inviting us for this, uh, uh, to, to, to their interesting uh, um, uh, series. And uh, it's a great pleasure to um, uh, be presenting with uh, uh, and discussing with uh, Fotini. Uh, in particular, I'd like to thank Ma Marina Hatsopoulos and uh, uh, Vasilis Papagostadinu and our, 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 our Consul General in, in Boston for this kind invitation. So uh, Fotini and I will talk about uh, a revolution that is underway and which has to do with uh, AI. And uh, uh, we're gonna go between uh, the technical side and the social uh, impact of the uh, technology that is being uh, developed. And uh, we, we also talk about uh, 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 um, a research center uh, under development that uh, uh, will hopefully be launched uh, this year. Uh, so uh, to anchor our understanding of the field of AI, I would like to give you a brief uh, uh, you know, small 10 minute overview of where the field is uh, right now. And I hope you can see the slides that I'm sharing. So um, in the past uh, decade or, or so, uh, machine learning research has uh, um, had some impressive uh, breakthroughs. Uh, which uh, we read about in the news and uh, which have solved uh, challenging problems in um, uh, AI uh, that have that have been uh, posed uh, for decades. 
Uh, the most impressive uh, achievements of the field right now are in image recognition, so understanding objects in images, uh, voice transcription, so understanding uh, uh, you know, text from voice signals, uh, translation, so computers are very good at translating uh, text between languages, um, uh, and um, uh, com computers have become very good at, at beating humans in very complex games like Go, which were considered uh, very hard uh, to solve. And uh, you know, more recently, uh, we've, uh, we have had impressive uh, developments in uh, the ability of computers to generate text. Uh, so uh, computers can process big uh, corpora of uh, texts and uh, 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 learn how to produce uh, text that seems very uh, uh, plausible uh, to have been produced by humans. So these are all impressive uh, developments and there is justified excitement about uh, um, the impact of those developments in the real world. These technologies are being deployed um, and uh, will continue to be deployed in, uh, and have impact in economy, in society, in health, uh, in um, uh, law enforcement, in you know, conflicts and so on and so forth. But what I would like to discuss a little bit to anchor our discussion and, and pass it over to Fotini to talk about uh, the societal uh, impacts is what these uh, apparent breakthroughs uh, really mean. And, and in particular, I, I would like to talk a little bit about the unredacted story of what is ha actually happening right now. So the machine learning pipeline uh, very naturally uh, 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 goes as follows. So uh, you uh, propose a, a cognitive task that you want computers to solve. Then you go out in the real world or you set up a, an experiment to collect a relevant data uh, for the learning problem uh, at hand. Uh, and then you, you throw a lot of optimization and statistics and probability on your learning task. You model it uh, probabilistically, you, you, you throw at it a lot of soft, a lot of optimization, a lot of hardware, a lot of data, and until eventually, uh, until it does well on the data you have collected, and then you deploy your model. And this this benchmark data the, are uh, should be thought of as data that is representative of the uh, conditions that your learning uh, system will find itself uh, in the future. So th this is this is very similar to training a kid to, uh, to solve a cognitive task. Uh, so you present different challenges to your kid until they actually eventually hopefully develop the ability to uh, solve the task. But um, in this pipeline uh, lie a lot of issues because uh, there is sort of an obsession with, pipe, with benchmarks uh, uh, in the field. And, and let me sort of like illustrate what that means and, and why is the, that is problematic. So, and uh, I'm, I'm gonna discuss, uh, you know, uh, image recognition, which is one of the most impressive developments in recent years. So how was image recognition solved? Uh, uh, people collected a lot of images from Flickr. Uh, they labeled the images with their contents. They created a humongous data set of uh, images labeled with what, with what contents they have. And then they uh, uh, trained very complex algorithms to, to uh, 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 given an image, predict the contents of the image. And, and here on the plot, you see the error rate of these algorithms uh, in time. And importantly, uh, between 2014 and 2015, uh, algorithms surpassed human uh, error. Uh, so you know, they became better than humans in the following sense. Uh, Andrei Karpathy, uh, who was a PhD student at Stanford at the time and who is now uh, the uh, director of AI at Tesla working on self-driving cars, sat down and uh, tried to, uh, uh, you know, looked at a bunch of images from this data set called ImageNet. And uh, he tried to label images with their contents and he checked how well he did compared to what the best, uh, uh, the error rate of the best algorithms that were around at the time. And uh, 
he noticed that uh, at around that time, computers were better than him, all right? Uh, and um, uh, thus, uh, you know, the conclusion was that uh, computers are better than humans in recognizing contents of images, so image recognition. Uh, but uh, what I want to ask is, uh, what, what does it really mean that, you know, what, what should we take away from the ability of computers to beat that specific human on this specific data set? And I claim that we shouldn't uh, try to extract too much from that. Because uh, um, even though image recognition is uh, uh, a problem in which we have made a lot of progress, nevertheless, uh, uh, computers, you know, even in this problem, fail pretty badly. And I want to show you uh, uh, some examples of that failure, of, of those failure, failure modes. So one is that uh, even though we can beat humans in uh, ImageNet, I mean, not me, computers can, uh, if you change a little bit the data set, so if you, uh, again, go to Flickr and collect images, but uh, play with the lighting conditions and the orientation of the objects, that uh, amazing accuracy of computers drops by significant amounts. Um, it has also been noticed that, um, uh, and, and that's a sort of a little bit different problem that Fotin is gonna expand upon a lot uh, uh, in a little bit, uh, computers um, uh, will incorporate in their predictions bias that exists in their data sets. And uh, uh, um, um, a, a, an important article written in ProPublica a few years ago uh, rings the alarm uh, on, on, on that issue. Because uh, as you may know, uh, image recognition and uh, prediction is uh, used in law enforcement. And um, it has been found that uh, uh, um, algorithms used in that setting are very biased, uh, uh, in particular replicating uh, uh, in their predictions biases that exist in the data sets that uh, these algorithms have been trained on. So they make for, you know, uh, you know in, in this particular instant, they, uh, they're biased against uh, 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 people of different races. Uh, so AI systems also fail miserably in, 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 in various tasks, and in particular, they can be tricked by humans. So at the bottom of the screen here, you see the phenomenon I discussed earlier, where sort of like changing the orientation of an image will make uh, an image recognition uh, uh, algorithm uh, completely change their prediction and to, to a very wrong prediction. At the bottom here, you see uh, a 3D turtle that uh, uh, some MIT students uh, created a few years ago. So those students, they painted the shell of the turtle in a very clever way so that uh, uh, best uh, image recognition software recognizes this turtle as a rifle. So it's very non-robust to um, uh, patterns that, uh, uh, that uh, the students uh, painted on the shell of that image. So on the upper left, you see a Tesla car that famously crashes uh, on, a, on a track that is uh, uh, stopped at the, on, on the left of, of a highway. And on the right, you see a robot that is failing to do a very simple uh, task. So these are all examples of uh, failure modes that uh, uh, our technology has, despite the, uh, um, what, what makes it into the uh, news, the, you know, showing the amazing progress that AI has had uh, in, the, in recent years. And, you know, my last uh, example of uh, failure mode uh, has to do with games. So um, uh, some important successes of AI in recent years has been the ability of algorithms to beat humans in very co complex games like Go and, and, and Texas Hold'em. On the other hand, what you see on the right is a different game. So it's one where a Waymo car, a self-driving car, uh, is trying to enter a highway, but the car is being antagonized by human drivers uh, and so much so that uh, uh, it abandons the attempt to enter the highway, uh, exits the highway and tries again. And the big question here is, how is it that uh, uh, algorithms can beat humans in very complex games that very few of us can play well 
while at the same time uh, technology like uh, algorithms fail to uh, uh, play well in games that many of us can actually uh, you know do reasonably well in all right so these are all examples of uh, failure modes of, of our technology and this is all to, to anchor our expectations before uh, sort of before Fotini um, uh, talks about the societal uh, uh, implications of, of the technology. Uh, so this was to anchor our understanding of what, what has happened and to um, uh, raise the issue of, uh, 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 of the, the technological gap that exists before real AI actually happens. So there are important obstacles to getting real AI out there. So what I believe we'll, we, we will see in the near future is uh, specific applications of, of, of uh, uh, this technology in domains that we understand very well, uh, in confined uh, uh, and well-defined uh, uh, applications. But we're not going to see uh, real AI applications because to get there, we need to uh, uh, solve uh, several technical uh, challenges. Uh, which have to do with robustness to uh, biased, incomplete and shifting data to dependencies that underlie your data, for example, in the context of a social network uh, behavior or a, a spatial or a temporal domain to a strategic behavior that underlies your data. So your algorithm is being antagonized by humans or other AIs and to changing objectives to um, um, uh, to, uh, we, we, which is an important thing that uh, humans are really good at, but uh, technology, but algorithms are very bad at, and, and which has to do with the fact that humans are very good at uh, transferring uh, intuition from some learning tasks that they have solved to some other new learning tasks that they don't have a lot of experience with. Humans do not need a lot of uh, training data to uh, develop a new uh, cognitive task. Computers need a lot of data to uh, new data to uh, transfer learning from something that they can do well to some other thing that they don't have experience with. Uh, uh, an important issue underlying uh, uh, robustness is uh, um, a causal inference. So uh, understanding the world is not about uh, being able to make predictions. It is about uh, understanding the causal mechanisms that uh, link uh, different variables that uh, underlie the world and are either observable or non-observable. So uh, a lot of emphasis has been placed recently on the ability of, of algorithms to make good predictions, but there's no understanding if you are not able to understand the causal mechanisms underlying your uh, uh, data. And uh, of course, and this is uh, what uh, Fotin is going to talk about, there is a ton of, once this technology is out uh, there in the real world, there is a ton of privacy, ethical, and societal issues that we need to understand. And we cannot uh, do that without uh, a, 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 a tight, a, a intimate interaction between um, 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 computer science and uh, other disciplines, importantly, uh, humanities. Uh, so with this brief uh, sort of like overview of where the field is, uh, I would like to now uh, uh, ask Fotini to uh, navigate uh, um, um, the societal uh, applications and implications of uh, computing and AI. Kosti, thank you for this. Uh, I think it was great to kind of benchmark where the technology is. And I, and I think it, it's to your credit that you actually did this in, in such a kind of responsible and humble way. What I want to highlight is that undoubtedly, this is a, a major breakthrough, the, you know, the computation revolution and its relations to artificial intelligence and what it means for the world. Arguably, the biggest technological innovation of our generation. I appreciate that you you kind of un, uh, uncovered some of its warts, but unfortunately, some of the problems are that people are taking these AI applications to the real world, and they have already been uh, creating issues and trouble, specifically in the US. Likely, things are a little more responsible in the EU context, both from a legal framework and otherwise. What I want to do is basically highlight 
not that there is an opportunity for kind of social scientists and humanists to engage, but there is actually a responsibility to do so, to make sure that AI is both being developed and used in a way that actually promotes the broader social good. So much like other technological innovations, like you know radiation or the atomic bomb or big medical discoveries, our first responsibility is really to engage with the ethical and social implications of these discoveries. And, and clearly there are several that are associated with, uh, uh, with AI. The second issue that I wanna to touch upon is, uh, is to get other scientists, not just the engineers and the social scientists to think about how they can interact with AI in their respective disciplines and specifically in social science and in humanistic research. And thirdly, I also want to talk about potential implications for public policy and use of AI in public policy. Actually, the EU has had some very interesting recent reports trying to problematize and think about that. And I think figuring out how to engage both the government and the private sector in this context would be really important. And, and I'm actually very keen to see how Kostadinos is thinking about potential connections of his institute and kind of the research dynamic uh, connecting to the real world um, and what that may mean. I understand that it's obviously that can't happen in real time, but I think it would still be important to kind of discuss. So I'm going to sketch out these three points and I will actually turn to Kosti every single, after every single one just to get a, some reaction. And I then look very much forward to engaging with everyone uh, in the Q&A and to get some, some more reactions and questions from you. So I think uh, it was great to see, because Adino started out with some of you, our experiences and interactions with AI in our everyday lives. And I'm gonna mention a few more like, you know, um, machine translation, chat bots in e-commerce or, or e-banking, uh, image recognition when you try to unlock your phone, online dating for the more adventurous of us, you know, finding your loved one or, uh, through, uh, through algorithms. Um, but there, there's also use in kind of much more consequential applications like AI is being used in medicine to diagnose cancer. It's being used in policing to not only to predict crime, but also to uh, suggest the likelihood of an offender reoffending, which was an example that the Costadino showed with the ProPublica article, or even in the industry when people are trying to hire personnel, often enough they rely, <clears throat> they rely on algorithms. And I'll actually use an example from a, a, a kind of a notorious example of Amazon trying to recruit through an AI uh, algorithm and actually leading to quite a bit of um, skewed results. So um, as a first point, I want to emphasize that by coming up with machines that can actually learn, as Costadinos was saying, observe the environment, learn and make decisions and often kind of better decisions than we can, depending on the task, we have given rise to machines with agency. And I, the fact that they can make these autonomous decisions, interact with other machines, interact with humans, means that there is a human machine system that we need to be understanding, regulating, and operating within. So the whole premise is obviously that, the, you know, you introduce these machines because they're better, faster at processing these big uh, sources of information. And you have this idea that they're, they, they're not susceptible to prejudice, that, you know, they don't have these human biases that we do. They come into this in some sort of neutral way. But I think Costis did a very good job at highlighting that they're actually as good as the data they learn from. So if the data is biased, we're just building machines that are further entrenching uh, these biases. And, and the fact, the, the problem with that is that often we're just not aware. We're just not aware of the different biases we're bringing into these. The tr we're, we're don't necessarily know the biases in the data. We don't necessarily are fully aware of the biases that the, that the the programmer may be bringing into this, et cetera. Another example I'm gonna use again from the US context on face recognition is, is that uh, it has often been very unreliable with African-American faces. And an example that one of our MIT colleagues uh, identified was basically the fact that leading black women in the US like Oprah Winfrey, Michelle Obama, Serena Williams, uh, face recognition was identifying them as men these iconic women were not kind of even recognized uh, for the gender they are. 
Another colleague from MIT very recently, she's an anthropologist, showed that commercial oximeters, these are the small devices that we put our finger in to figure out the level of oxygen that we have, they're a lot less effective on dark skin. So basically these oximeters, while they overestimate oxygen levels 3% of the time for white patients, they overestimate those levels 12% of the time for African-American patients. And you can see how this could be really detrimental, especially uh, with a disease like COVID, which attacks uh, kind of our oxygen levels and, uh, and our whole kind of uh, pulmonary system. Uh, some natural language processing algorithms, when you look at how what they associate with Muslim or Islam, they complete sentences immediately using words about violence and terrorism. Then the hiring algorithm that I mentioned from Amazon, it excluded women from getting hired because it was it had been trained on successful applicants being men. So just and these these were some algorithms that are out there operating in the real world and actually have direct implications in the way kind of we live uh, and and go about our lives in in health in employment in in and in other kind of aspects. Uh, so these these obviously have a lot of ethical implications, societal implications. Figuring out who can whose lives is affect are affected. Um, you know, people who get misdiagnosed, wrongly convicted, don't get hired. I mean, who do you blame for that? Do you blame, who, who has accountability? Where's the transparency in all this? I mean, understanding that, that accountability chain is, is quite important. And I think this is where a lot of uh, colleagues across disciplines, be it philosophers of ethics, sociologists, anthropologists, lawyers could get involved and actually engage uh, with these different dynamics. And I think it's also important, even though AI is obviously a lot more advanced, both in terms of research and in terms of application in the US, I think it's important to start thinking about how it would work in the Greek context and, it, and what it may mean for the cleavages we have in, in our society. Migrants, refugees, uh, the Roma community, our Muslim community in the north, how the potential introduction of such algorithms, if it's not done in kind of an intentional way, what what it what uh, injustices it may, it may lead to. And I already highlighted that um, the EU is a lot more careful in uh, in thinking about AI application in the real world. Part of it has to do with the fact that we're not the EU is not as advanced on the research level of in AI, but it's also because it, it just operates differently when it comes to uh, the rights and freedoms of people in the digital world. And we've seen that with the fact that they are a lot more careful about data privacy. And they, are, they also already have several reports on kind of thinking about AI and, that are, are very thoughtful and setting the stage of how this could be used in uh, in uh, the in the public policy realm as well, Kosti. Before I kind of go on to talk about how social scientists could be using AI for their own research, I I just wondered if you had kind of a reaction. Yeah, so um, the data bias issue is a very important one, and uh, uh, and in fact there are many flavors of uh, uh, data bias that uh, we should be aware of. So one is uh, the bias of incompleteness of data, so missing entire subpopulations, or um, uh, having you know so so having a badly designed experiment that um, you know misses uh, relevant data. Uh, th but there are also other important uh, sources of uh, data bias that we should be thinking be besides incompleteness. And one is something that I alluded to earlier, which has to do with dependencies. Uh, and, uh, um, and, and, and sort of like uh, thinking about dependencies appends completely the model with, and the framework within which uh, we are thinking of making predictions. Because, you know, like for example, in the context of the hiring decisions, uh, the underlying assumption there is that uh, the algorithm needs to look at my resume and make a prediction uh, about how well I will do in a particular job. But the truth of the matter is that we are not uh, units, we're not little units that, you know, whose features map to behavior. We are, uh, uh, units, we, we are units within a context, a social context. And you cannot make predictions about how well somebody will do if you do not take into account the context. 
And the foundations, uh, you know, uh, you know, most of the foundations of the field right now are laid in uh, under the premise that we're mapping a single individual to how well they will do. Uh, but this is uh, uh, ignoring the peer effects, which are so important for social sciences, right? So the same individual with the same resume in two different contexts will have a, a completely different uh, uh, outcome. So that is important to recognize and uh, incorporate in our, uh, 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 our tools, uh, uh, this thinking and of course the interaction with social sciences and uh, psych you know, uh, psychology, uh, sociology are, you know, is, is very important there. Uh, the other uh, source of data bias that it's important to uh, uh, how to, to, to think about is uh, the one uh, uh, resulting from uh, strategic phenomena underlying the data. And again, back to the you know, algorithmic hiring uh, example, um, when you design a, a, an algorithm that processes resumes and scores individuals, you shouldn't ignore the fact that uh, individuals will strategize on their features because they know that you're using that algorithm, right? So the, the individuals are also ag strategic agents who are gonna uh, misreport or manipulate uh, the, whatever they write in their CV uh, to uh, manipulate uh, uh, you know, the, the, the scoring that will result by running your algorithm. So we shouldn't, we shouldn't ignore that. And that provides another very interesting connection between uh, AI and economics and, and, and game theory. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, so the, 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 the overall sort of like reaction to what you're saying, Fotin, is that data bias is a super important problem uh, that we should be thinking about a lot of different types of biases, incompleteness, dependencies, strategic phenomena underlying the data. And uh, there are technical tools uh, from statistics and game theory to take care of these biases or at least reduce the bias that makes it into the algorithm. However, and you know, that's important to emphasize, it's not only a technical problem. Uh, and so we do, we need uh, uh, domain expertise from fields that have been thinking uh, about these issues for, uh, you know, years, okay, for, for decades. So we, we need that interaction. It's not that we shouldn't be techno optimists thinking that math is gonna uh, solve uh, the issues. We should engage with uh, uh, yeah, uh, the disciplines that are uh, domain experts in these kinds of issues. Yeah, thank you, Kosti. I mean, I appreciate this. And, I, and as I said, I mean, this is uh, this is not just being about kind of kumbaya, ecumenical and the cross-disciplinary approach, but it's really uh, trying to figure out how to come up with the tools that actually work and, and capture kind of this human machine interaction in the best possible way. I did also want to kind of uh, dovetail a little bit into uh, the potential use of AI in the social sciences and, and the fact that uh, there are other folks beyond engineers and computer scientists who've been really excited about the computational revolution and the fact that there are now better ways and easier ways to process big data to address social phenomena. Um, the fact that a lot, a lot of uh, text now exists in digitized form, there's data availability in the, term, in the form of cell phones, mobility data, social media data, there has been a lot, an increase in the use of kind of AI and machine learning techniques specifically in social science research. For, for instance, in my work, uh, which kind of focuses on uh, conflict and cooperation in the Muslim world, I have used uh, hundreds of millions of cell phone records from Yemen to try and understand the effect of drone strikes on patterns of communication among civilians, as well as what it means for forced displacement. I've also looked at millions of social media posts across three social media platforms, Facebook, Twitter, and Telegram, to account for the trajectory of violence in Syria. And I'm also using millions of images from Instagram to gauge the effect of a stricter headscarf law that has been passed in Iran and what effect this has had on women uh, deciding to appear on social media and how they choose to engage. So these are just some kind of examples that show that 
social scientists are keen to figure out ways to engage with the multitude of data that's out there. And this is so big that no kind of, it would be in, impossible for individual coders to, to kind of process this uh, appropriately. So we rely on kind of different existing methods uh, across AI to, 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 and machine learning to try and, try and process uh, data in this form and come up with some sort of inference. So in economists, political scientists, linguists are increasingly engaging with machine learning techniques. And I could see how they could be really exciting for the Greek context as well, given how, how much use there is of social media. A lot of people engage in social media, and I think even more so after COVID, where we've seen a lot of different age groups engage. And one could see how using structural topic models could get at underlying attitudes uh, of the public towards migrants and refugees. It could help us understand the level of fake news and misinformation when it comes to issues like the COVID vaccine. So there are many kind of real life, interesting and exciting issues that we could be addressing, looking at this data and using these methods. But I, I wanna say that there are also opportunities for historians and for humanists like in philology and comparative literature, especially given the increased level of digitized texts. And I know there has been a push among universities and libraries in Greece as well to digitize more text. And, you know, given the revolution, uh, you know, someone who may have wanted to see digitized texts on the Greek revolution, one could see how, you know, scouring through all the different available texts, he could try to see to what degree there were positive engagements and economic collaborations with the Ottomans at the same time that we were fighting against them. One could look at the way the different heroes were portrayed over time, what the role of the women was and how it was captured. And what's exciting about us is that you could look at similar documents in the Ottoman language and how they, they were covering these aspects. And obviously the things that would emerge would be topics, and I'm not arguing that this would cover the capture the underlying ontologies fully or give you kind of beautiful narratives or sentiment, but it would be a very interesting way in kind of to map up, uh, as I said, the different underlying topics that I, that appear. So I'm going to kind of turn to Costis for some reaction here. I see him already smirking. So. Yeah. So, uh, th that is a, a fascinating, uh, direction for humanities in my view. Uh, it's important to uh, uh, sort of like tie it with the uh, need for sort of like uh, understanding causal mechanisms underlying your data. Uh, and, you know, uh, in relation to the Greek revolution, I would be very interested uh, in counterfactual predictions. What would have happened uh, in the Greek revolution had uh, this uh, person done something different, right? So, uh, I think like sort of like the litmus test for understanding uh, your data is your ability to make counterfactual predictions. So I would be thrilled if uh, uh, insights from uh, humanities uh, uh, can be combined with uh, data and statistics in such a way that such uh, um, mechanisms are revealed that would allow us to make uh, interesting inferences of, the, of that form. Yeah, I think to the degree that we could be capitalizing on kind of um, natural forms of variation in the sorts of like natural experiments or discontinuities or some sort of sudden disruptions to try to get at some of this would be really, uh, could be really interesting. So the third point, and, and I'm also cognizant in, on time, so I'm going to try to be brief so we can open it up for discussion with everyone, is really thinking about can we, can we be bringing these AI tools to the actual policy realm. And I know it may sound scary given what the Costadinos just showed us and you know the difficulties of uh, and how they can how some of these AI tools can really be gamed. But at the same time we know they are being used in the real world, especially in, in the US context. And, and there's great interest in trying to exploit all their efficiencies to actually get better service provision. So how can we think about uh, efficiencies gained through AI for improved healthcare, especially at an, you know, in an overburdened Greek medical system? How can we think about cleaner transport systems, reduced energy consumption, greener agriculture, more effective policing? I mean, these are obviously all things that we're interested in, care about, 
um, and we'd love to gain some efficiencies if, if there are ways to do that through these tools. Um, and we can see how just developing some smarter analytical capabilities and minimizing repetitive tasks, which are things that you know, AI could help us do, would get us a long way into improving uh, some of these services. Uh, but at the same time, I think it would also be important to understand what the right framework should be in terms of the government and uh, and how the government should be engaging with these uh, with these policies. I thought it was really interesting in in a in a recent report by the EU. They were saying that, you know, governments have been thinking about how you govern AI, so governance of AI, but not governance with AI. They're kind of, they've been limited and kind of behind as compared to the US in thinking about how to engage AI in actual uh, service delivery problems and other problems that uh, that should make kind of lives of constituents and citizens easier. So uh, I lifted a couple of examples they mentioned about uses of AI in, in Europe and and I should say they they feel a lot more innocuous than kind of the uses we've seen in the U.S. context. So there's the use of self-driving snow plows in an airport in Norway, trying to improve the clearing of snow on runways. In Latvia, there is a chat box that helps you uh, that helps answer frequently asked questions about how you register a company. And the one that I thought was probably the most uh, the most uh, risque was uh, a, a nursery child recruitment system that it's used in Warsaw in Poland. So the algorithm there considers data provided by parents during registration and calculates a score that tells whether people will be, children will be assigned or not to a nursery and to which one. So just giving you some examples from uh, the European context, but I think really thinking about beyond kind of the basic chat box or intelligent digital assistants uh, that we see we see them being used in how else can we use ai in for instance in uh, you know the national health system for schools and i underline schools and education because we've seen kind of a a, a great interest in robotics in schools i feel like People have been doing exceptionally well at greek students in all these robotics competitions i think it would be really interesting to see uh, to what degree we can engage with students in other aspects of AI. And, and I'm keen to see, I think this is a great uh, transition to uh, the institute that you're setting up, Kostadina, and how you feel, to what degree, I mean, obviously it's research is at the core, but to what degree you think uh, these other aspects could be considered? Yeah, so uh, I should say that I'm also bullish uh, about applications of AI in uh, the real world. Uh, we have to be cognizant about uh, risks that we, we, we would be taking if we uh, 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 implemented technology without uh, being careful and cautious. But there are um, um, applications, typically, as I mentioned earlier, more well-defined, where I do think there are lots of opportunities to improve operations using uh, uh, um, data science and, and computing. So, uh, and, and now uh, let me say a little bit about, uh, in connection to that as well, uh, what uh, I'm planning to, to set up in, in Greece. So uh, it is a, a research center. So the goal is for it to be a world-class uh, research center in AI, data science and algorithms. So uh, the research center uh, is uh, being implemented with a pair of wonderful uh, collaborators and renowned scientists, uh, Christos Papadimitriou and uh, Timos Selis. And it's also uh, implemented with the support and under the uh, aegis of the 2021 uh, committee that is led by Yana Gelopoulos Daskalaki. As I said, the goal is to be a world-class research center on these topics. Uh, and in particular, both develop the foundations of the field of AI, uh, but also the connection uh, to other disciplines and application domains, such as uh, healthcare. Uh, the uh, goal of the Institute is to uh, increase the extroversy and the stature of Made in Greece uh, research and innovation. Uh, and uh, uh, in particular to engage uh, the excellent academics that we do have in Greece 
uh, as well as the excellent academics that we have abroad in the best universities in the world to lead uh, you know, uh, that uh, effort of, of, of uh, uh, bringing uh, Greek uh, research and innovation to the uh, world uh, stage. Uh, um, of course, uh, being a leader in research in itself uh, is great, but uh, uh, it's important to understand uh, why you want to do that. And uh, besides the intellectual uh, importance of the end endeavor, uh, what we plan is to engage with the, um, uh, the society and economy. And in particular, uh, we plan to have a uh, uh, incubation center uh, associated with a, a research center that we do technology uh, transfer and see the um, research being transferred to um, startups, uh, the economy and, the, and, and society and the public sector. Uh, so we uh, ultimately, what, what we want to do is to bring uh, a dream team of uh, academics from abroad to Greece, engage them with uh, research that happens in Greece and uh, to um, create a hub where uh, Greek uh, faculty and uh, Greek uh, uh, entrepreneurs and uh, Greek students are gonna engage with uh, 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 academics and entrepreneurs from abroad. So it's going to be a non-degree granting uh, institution. It's going to be a private institution, but it's going to engage uh, uh, with uh, uh, um, uh, Greek universities and, and, and you know, companies in the public sector. This is roughly speaking what we're envisioning. This is great. Uh, Michali, if you could... Uh... I mean, it would be terrific if you could kind of come in, join in. I see, we would love to hear your reactions too, obviously. And I, I think there's some activity I can see in the chat, so. Uh, there is a lot of activity in the chat. And I will uh, uh, ask for forgiveness for all the participants because I will have to do a very coarse uh, summarization of the questions. So I'm going to first start a theme that I see in these questions is that uh, as Costadinos explained very eloquently, uh, AI is not infallible. Uh, you can trick current forms of AI, current forms of machine learning easily. Nevertheless, we are going to use it. It seems that we are going to use it. Uh, is good enough? Uh, a, a good yardstick? For most cases, are there cases where AI has to be completely infallible? Humans, after all, aren't. Is it uh, enough for AI to be better than humans to be utilized? What are your maybe philosophical thoughts on that? Constantina. Uh, so I, I'm actually like, Maybe a better framework to be thinking about this problem is uh, not uh, as a dichotomy between humans and AI, but as a, uh, a com complementarity be between humans and AI. So I think that certainly in uh, life critical uh, scenarios, I wouldn't want to use a technology that is not, uh, that is not associated with uh, uh, safety guarantees. So if we're going to use uh, technology to, to, you know, to screen our, uh, you know, like uh, medical images, okay, I would like some uh, guarantee that, uh, you know, the false, you know, positive or false negative uh, rates uh, are set in such a way that, uh, uh, and, and that, uh, you know, like, uh, even if there is a moderate risk that the AI missed something, uh, a human will also take a look. We should recognize, you know, where technology, like technology, technology maybe can expedite screening of uh, uh, medical images that are very uh, clear cut. But uh, we shouldn't ignore, at this point at least, humans' uh, ability to to, to 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 get more robust conclusions from, from from the data. So I think we shouldn't be thinking about it as a dichotomy, but more as a complementarity. What do you mean? Yeah, no, I think, I, yeah, I think that uh, highlights this kind of human machine interaction that has been the theme uh, from the beginning of this uh, discussion and panel, that this is really kind of an ecosystem. It's 
it's we've trained a machine to actually make decisions, but the machine cannot be held accountable for the decisions. And I think this is what we need to keep in mind. So where does the accountability lie? And when it comes to things like, you know, making mistakes on a chat bot about, you know, the, the pair of shoes you bought or something, you know, it may be something that you wouldn't mind as much. But if when it's issues around incarceration, you know, pe putting people behind bars, making sure people actually survive an illness rather than getting misdiagnosed. I mean, these are critical aspects where figuring out the balance and, you know, where the human oversight comes in and where the accountability and transparency aspects are, I think are really important. Uh, it's, uh, as Constantinos correctly uh, pointed, it's humans with AI at this point in time, the framework that we should be thinking of, as opposed to humans versus AI, which is what you know science fiction has always been concerned with, and maybe what uh, at some point generalized AI, if we ever get there, uh, will bring. Uh, Fotini gave me a much nicer dimension to think about it though, and to unify the fields, which is governance with or of AI, which I think it's the main axis uh, we should be thinking. Uh, I would like to change gears a little bit. I see a lot of uh, geeky, fellow geeky questions out there. Uh, a lot of kids are asking, uh, what should they, oh, I'm sorry, I don't know how old you are, but uh, since you want to learn, I consider you eternal kids. Uh, uh, they are asking uh, from very practical things, how to transition from the roles of application developer to data scientist. Uh, uh, and uh, what tools should they learn? What resources they should be getting? How they should be uh, getting more uh, uh, qualified to do to participate in this uh, current technological evolution or revolution. Uh, I think that both of you are qualified there, uh, especially Fotini, who has worked a lot with data scientists and uh, Constantinos, because you know, obviously what the tools are there and what people are doing in the universities these days. I think it would be cool for Costis to start on, only because I'm, I'm keen to see how he's thinking about this also for the Institute. Where is this space? Do you expect that people come ready with the tools and then they get straight into the research? How do you envision that? Given that obviously there's very great interest. Uh, yeah, so uh, it depends on the background of this. So regarding the Institute, it depends on the background of the student, but but you know, like to Mihalis's question as well. So, um, so there are several components that make a good uh, data scientist, uh, but the most important thing that you want to avoid is that you, uh, uh, you know, learn how to run a few tools and uh, that someone else made without uh, understanding what these tools are actually doing. So this is what you want to avoid and that uh, suggests what you should uh, 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 try to accomplish which is a good anchoring in uh, the underlying probability of statistics and a good algorithm on machine learning and you know, uh, the algorithms that are uh, uh, driving uh, insights that uh, uh, AI and machine learning are, 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 are deriving. So you need to understand the underlying mechanisms. Otherwise, you would be responsible for failures when, when you apply your uh, tools. So. Uh, uh, that, that being said, you have to understand where the data is coming from. And this is where domain expertise is important. So uh, you cannot, uh, in other words, you cannot uh, solve an application for a particular domain if you don't talk to people who understand the data and can offer some insight about what the data is about, how it was collected, what you're trying to accomplish. No, I think I was, what Costis is highlighting is obviously the need to kind of have all the fundamental tools. And the nice thing about Greece, at least in, in, in several uh, technical contexts, is that it, prov it provides this very good baseline in kind of, you know, uh, probability, basic understanding of statistics, etc. Then figuring out what the tools are that you can layer on this. Actually, it's, it's impressive how many of these are available in the, you know, on a DEX and on a bunch of different educational platforms where people can start engaging and seeing kind of applications of some of these 
uh, tools and techniques and machine learning applications, especially. Uh, and obviously, I agree with the Kostadinov that you can't go rogue, just kind of think you learned them on your own and, and try to, to come up with a tool, especially that would be ready to be deployed for governance. <laughs> but, uh, but I do think there's a lot of tools you could be uh, picking up a, alongside your main uh, university studies. And, and obviously, the domain expertise is there and it's critical, especially if you want to get at causal inference and address underlying biases. But, uh, but I think it, it doesn't mean that you need to start engaging beyond your, obviously your university classes. And, and it's impressive to see how many things are available on edX on, on that front. Okay, can I add something? Yes, yes. Uh, I think programming uh, probability and statistics should become a required subject in, uh, you know, across, you know for, for all students of universities. Uh, how about linear algebra and sociology? Sure. Uh, I think that the, you know, one of the main problems of the Greek educational system uh, is that, you know, it splits those things very early on and then uh, we have to join them later on. Uh, uh, the uh, Costadina, uh, I, I got a lot of geeky questions, so uh, I need to, I will push there a little bit on the low from uh, from bottoms up, uh, a lot of people are getting concerned. Says, why are we using you know so inefficient computational inefficient things like Python to do machine learning these days and AI, and we're not using something that would give us a lot more speed and maybe negate the uh, advantage that the huge internet companies have. It's you know it's common knowledge that. If you want to run huge models, you have to rely on infrastructures that they have. As in the universities, are, for us in the universities, it's getting more and more difficult to, to do this kind of research in you know, running state-of-the-art models like GPT-3, for example. Yeah, so, um, so Python is used as a, for, a, for prototyping purposes. So it's a very front end sort of like lightweight, easy to code uh, language, but trust me that in the back end, uh, things are optimized. So when you, train your, when you train your machine learning model in the data center, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the moment you, you, know, you hit the hardware, uh, things are super optimized. So we wouldn't have, of course, it's very, I agree, it's very wasteful to use Python for back end stuff and it's not used there. It's, but it's, it, it, it expedites a lot the process of uh, looking at your data, fooling around with uh, different tools, uh, having nice visualizations, right? So it's a, it's a great tool for front end development, but not uh, what, what is happening in, in, you know, in, in behind the scenes. Fortini, if you could go back to your earlier education years and uh, you would uh, you know had the opportunity to learn something or to study something that you didn't uh, given today's uh, you know developments what would it be I for think... me it would be linear algebra and statistics uh, i didn't pay attention to linear algebra until very late in my graduate school because it was taught 8 to 9 a.m so i never went to that class in the Greek university, for example. For me, I think I think more programming um, because I had to kind of learn it the hard way by just like, for instance, learning how to use R and uh, and and Python for some of uh, of the work we do um, uh, with text. And uh, and I think had I paid them more more attention, I mean, I did take a C plus plus class as an undergrad, <laughs> but I think I should, I could have done more and should have done more. And, and probably that. So I appreciated uh, Kostadinos' point about the need to also integrate that. And I see beat through scratch or whatever, young kids are now engaging in this concept of programming from a very young age. And I actually applaud that. I think that's terrific. Uh, Michali, Michali, can I psychoanalyze you a little bit regarding linear sure. algebra? I, th I think that... <laughs> I think uh, what uh, you were missing, I think, uh, and I think I, I was also missing when I was doing linear algebra myself, is uh, I wasn't aware of the importance of linear algebra. And, and that is a, sort of like a general phenomenon. So uh, 
there is a little bit of a disentanglement between uh, you know starting a subject in, in school and early years of college to uh, you know how this thing came about why is it important to study it what are the applications uh, both uh, intellectual but also practical of that uh, tool uh, this is the reason why it's hard to understand why linear algebra is important when you're first year you have no idea how important it is uh, and i think like that speaks a lot also like that suggests a lot about how we would like to uh, restructure our curricula and the engagement of school, like starting from very early years with uh, society, right? So like somehow, well, you know, when I was in school, I thought that, you know, I, I'm presented uh, with some knowledge uh, that I had no idea, you know, where I'm going to apply. And I certainly thought that I will apply it in 20 years, right? So starting school, I thought that you know there is a 20 year training uh, procedure and then after 20 years I'm going to start using those tools of course if you're looking at the horizon of 20 years it's very hard to engage uh, so uh, you know I think it's very important for school from early years to engage with um, uh, uh, society uh, 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 kids are very creative uh, they have a lot of free time the you know they have fresh uh, minds and they could certainly they could contribute to the the world around them uh, rather you know as opposed to being passive you know observers until you know they become twenty or something right so um, that it's important to think about these types of engagements with the real world. Yeah, you know you are obviously you are preaching to the converted. Here I work at the media lab. Experiential learning it was always a big theme there, and but. After all these years, uh, I guess uh, experiential learning is the first, the best way, and the better than that, if you do uh, uh, want to indulge in a subject, is to have to teach it. I guess you can, as Marvin Minsky was saying, you can, you never understand something unless you are able to explain it in two different ways. Uh, so it's a very interesting uh, thought from one of the founders of uh, the field uh, of uh, artificial uh, intelligence. Uh, I, I'm not sure how much uh, more time we have. Uh, I think we covered uh, the initial lost time with the spinning uh, uh, wheels. Uh, there are lots of questions for Constantinos as to when that center of his is going to be up and running in Greece. I think that uh, he answered already. I don't think there is a definite date, but he's pushing to get it started as soon as possible. Uh, there are lots of uh, questions about, there is the always, always uh, the question about when we will have generalized AI comes back. I don't know. Costadine, uh, any thoughts on that? A general AI? Yeah, <laughs> uh, there's so many gaps in our understanding that it's you know very hard to predict. Uh, and you know, like I guess, yeah, um, many years in my in my view. Hopefully, before you know, hopefully in our lifetimes. But uh, you know, I think that's I want to see that. But uh, you know, it's unclear it will happen. Uh... Stratos tells me that we have uh, 10 more minutes, uh, so uh, I, get to <laughs> I, I get to ask more questions. Uh, uh, and actually, I want to comment, but uh, since I started reading about AI uh, very early in college, uh, generalized AI was always 20 years away. It has always been 20 years away. And if you see today, it's still 20 years out. I think the more we learn about the human brain, uh, the, we realize that the farther away the goal is. Uh, but from one perspective, I think it's the ultimate scientific endeavor. And uh, it's in our nature to keep pursuing it uh, overall. Uh, the, I wanted to tie it a little bit more with Christo. Um, here uh, and if there is one thing that I 
it became obvious uh, with the current developments and the current revolution in machine learning, the, the explosion in machine learning. Uh, it seems like it has become the Sri Racha, the hot sauce of science these days. Uh, uh, every scientific publication becomes better with a use of a little bit machine learning. But uh, uh, has it really, is it really that much different than, is it anything different fundamentally than another paradigm in computing? Instead of having intentional programming, we are programming machines by example, uh, and instead of doing huge calculations uh, or very long, tedious calculations, we are sifting through data right now. Uh, have we really made, uh, because of machine learning, any progress in understanding human intelligence more at this point? Um, For me, or... For me sense, you want to go first? Yeah, my sense is just that the fact that actually these tools we can take and, and use in other contexts is definitely an important breakthrough. So the fact, and, and it, it's not, I mean, it's not random that, you know, AI has been around for 50 or so years, but it's really now the computational breakthroughs that all these kind of new tools have been coming up and machine learning is coming to the forefront. I mean, for, for me as a social scientist, it has been really exciting to be able to shift through bulks of data and get at uh, and trying to get at inference in ways that you know more traditional uh, data collection or field work uh, wouldn't fully satisfy. So my sense is that at least in other sciences, this is uh, there is added value. But I'm curious to see what uh, Kosadinov thinks in comparison to in, in his kind of CS context. Yeah, so first to agree with Fotini that uh, the recent progress, if anything, has enabled uh, this diffusion of uh, uh, tools and uh, ideas from uh, computing to other scientists, uh, to other sciences and, and, and fields. And, and that is very important because, you know, we start, you know, uh, understanding the importance of computation uh, as, let's say, uh, glue, uh, uh, you know, uh, the glue of different sciences. Now, uh, did we uh, understand anything about intelligence by, by doing this? I, I would claim yes, okay, in the following sense that um, by trying to replicate some cognitive ability outside of the human body on, on so, in, in some machine and succeeding, uh, you understand that a particular cognitive task might not be as hard as you thought. At the same time, if you fail, to with, with, you know, with existing tools do that, that also gives you insight about uh, something more interesting that is happening in the human brain regarding that particular cognitive task. Just, just to anchor it, uh, computers, as I described, have, you know, are able to beat humans in Go and Texas Hold'em. What does that show? Well, Go is a hard game. However, the mathematical tools that we have about it, you know, uh, the, the understanding, the mathematical understanding we have about Go, uh, combined with uh, hardware development, are able to solve Go, like at least better than humans. Not completely solved, but better than humans. So that reveals something about Go. Okay, it says that our mathematical understanding of the game, uh, plus enough compute, damn compute, not super, you know, creative necessarily compute can solve the game. On the other hand, our inability to create algorithms that, uh, you know, uh, transfer learning from some cognitive task to another, the data hungriness of our algorithms, which is much, much higher than, you know, the data hungriness of humans who are very good at adapting their skills from one task to the other, shows an important uh, ability of the human brain that we don't know how to replicate. Uh, uh, outside of the human body. And that's a natural target for us to look further. So this, in other words, just to, to, to summarize what I'm trying to say, our ability to, our, our access to hardware and our ability to, and access to data and our ability to expedite this trial and error process, uh, trying to uh, develop cognitive abilities uh, outside the human brain, sheds light on 
uh, which uh, cognitive tasks are tractable and which cognitive ta tasks are less tractable uh, and require changing the paradigm to, to attack them. So in that sense, I think we are making progress. Uh, I think that's a good, uh, I think Costadino's actions uh, um, as being here speak a lot to what we believe as to whether Greece can play a role uh, in this uh, uh, ongoing revolution. Uh, it's good that we're speaking uh, on the bicentennial of the uh, Greek revolution, as it is called. Uh, Vasily Papa Costadino gave me a very nice uh, closing uh, to make. Uh, first of all, uh, I feel very lucky to be in, to closing this panel because it's the best reason why I have been at MIT for so long. The ability to meet, socialize, become friends with people like today's panelists. It also reminds me that there is a continuum. And uh, I'm gonna read, I'm gonna finish with uh, a poem from uh, Vertuzos last book, What Will It Be? In 1997, he was writing about uh, the growing schism between the humanities, the humans and the technologies, the humanities and technology. That, uh, by the way, is a very uh, basic characteristic, inherent characteristic of the Greek secondary education system that really needs to change now. Not tomorrow, today. And I will read the poem. Techies, mind your prescriptions for the world. Humis, tone down your fears of techno change. Step outside your precious castles. Look within before the split. Fill the space that makes you whole. Enjoy the sunset and the will. Argue from logic and emotion. Technology is humanity's child. And it is our quest for human purpose. To love them is to love ourselves. There are no differences, only labels. So if we learn something from today, from this continuum, is that Greeks were always at the forefront. It is time for Greece to join them there. Thank you very much. Uh, we are going to have a, a commercial uh, about our next event right now. And with that, I'm gonna thank the panelists again, uh, my friends, Fotini and Constantino, for being together with us today in this very interesting discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all.